Thanks everyone for coming today. My name is Renuka. I am a recent graduate of UCID and I majored in the Departments of Studies in Religion. Um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that this discussion is taking place on stolen Aboriginal land. I'm zooming in from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which is also the land that the University of Sydney sits on. As a place of education and learning, it's important to be open about the fact that Aboriginal peoples passed down invaluable knowledge for tens of thousands of years before they were violently dispossessed of their lands and that higher educational institutions like the University of Sydney are still complicit in devaluing traditional ways of learning. Religion has also been used as a very successful tool of colonization throughout the world. And when we talk about religion in Australia, it's important to include indigenous religion in these discussions and acknowledge the ways in which religion is still being used as a tool of colonization today. Um, another note that I want to add before we start is I'd just like to take a minute to remember and pay respect to Alana Bowden, who tragically lost her life yesterday. Um, Alana was a student, a staff member, and soon to be PhD candidate of the Department of Studies and Religion. Um, she played an enormous role in saving both this department and also the Department of Theatre and Performance Studies at UCID when they were under attack this year. And yeah, it's, um, it's pretty devastating. And I can honestly say that I don't know if we'd be here today discussing a successful campaign and a hopeful future for the department um, without her love and dedication to it and um, the immense amount of time and effort she put into the campaign to save it. Um, two weeks ago, she wrote a beautiful article for Onisoir um, about the power of solidarity when we campaign together to fight for something. Um, and yeah, it made me cry and I spoke to others about it and I know I'm not the only one. Um, she was a really beautiful writer and one who could perfectly encapsulate the emotions she was feeling um, and put them down on the page to share with everybody else. And um, yeah, her loss is gonna be feel, felt really deeply across the whole university, but um, in the Department of Studies and Religion in particular. Um, so I'm just going to put the, the article in the chat if anyone wants to read it later. But if um, anybody else wants to, you know, quickly say something about Alana before we kick off with the main discussion, feel free to do so now, I guess. All right, we might get started then. Um, so today we're going to get into a few different things. Um, why studies and religion is an important discipline, why it's undervalued generally across Australia and across the English speaking world. Um, what the connection between religion and politics looks like in Australia compared to other countries around the world and how it's kind of treated in a higher education context as well. So as we go along, if anyone in the audience has any questions or wants clarification on anything, feel free to just put an asterisk in the chat and I will come to you so that you can ask any questions. Um, but to begin with, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of what it actually means to study religion from like an academic and historical point of view rather than a theological point of view. So importantly, it's kind of about critically engaging with faith, attempting to define its role and function throughout both historical and temporary societies. Um, and a major part of that is charting how it's changed throughout history. Um, defining what religion actually is, is not an easy task to begin with. Um, and it involves looking at traditional religions from like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, but also at new religions like Wicca and Scientology. One of my favorite subjects at uni was called Contemporary Australian Religion. Um, it was actually taught by Carol at the time. <laughs> Um, and it involved talking about like indigenous religions and also religious practice and ideology when it relates to like secular activities, um, stuff that we wouldn't usually think of as religious, like Anzac Day, sporting events, that kind of thing, like war, patriotism, popular culture. A lot of people think of studies in religion as just another like esoteric venture, but it's genuinely extremely practical um, and very useful in a lot of ways. Um, and that's kind of just one example um, of how it's shown, I guess, in society. Um, 
yeah, the Department of Studies of Religion at UCID is a fantastic department. And I'm, I was very lucky to major there at my time at university. Um, there are very few universities across the country that actually study religion through a secular lens rather than a theological one. Um, so to get straight into it, I've talked long enough. Um, I'd like to welcome Carol Cusack and David Smith who have kindly joined us today to discuss. Um, Carol is a professor of religious studies in the Department of Studies and Religion at UCID. She's been teaching at the university for over 30 years. Um, so her wealth of knowledge and experience is incredibly impressive. Um, her research interests include medieval Christianity, European mythology, theories of conversion, Western esotericism and contemporary religious trends. Um, and it's also her birthday. So everybody wish Carol a happy birthday. <laughs> um, so thanks so much for joining us, Carol. Would you like to just introduce yourself and maybe talk a bit about why studies in religion is an important discipline? Thank you, Renuka. Um, I think that it's important to acknowledge that studies in religion, religious studies, studies of religion, it's called various different things around the globe. Um, in Australia has never had great purchase at all. And it's partly because it's poorly understood. And it's poorly understood because the construction of the sacred secular binary is a bit combinat, it's a bit muddled, it's a bit difficult. Um, when we talk about how politics looks, you know, in the UK, there's an established religion. It's the Church of England. The queen, who is a monarch, is actually also head of the Church of England. In Australia, there's no established religion. So section 116 of the constitution actually says that you can't have an established religion and you can't favor any religion over another. But the problem is that Australia has three levels of government. And it's at the level of state government that most of the legislation that enables um, religion to play a quite large part in public, public life, that's where it, it kind of happens. So for example, the High Court of Australia has actually ruled the school chaplaincy program unconstitutional on three separate occasions. But it continues to happen because the money comes from state governments and the High Court of Australia is ruling on the constitution which applies to federal government. Now, just the fact that I don't think many people know that sort of stuff would suggest that there's an advantage in being able to look at religion in a non-confessional way to see how it's deployed in society for various um, ends and through various means, I guess, too. Um, I had an interesting example today. This is what I'll finish with for my little intro. In my two o'clock tutorial, we were discussing the potentiality that there might be religious exemptions for vaccines in the era of COVID-19, you know, which I think everybody would agree is a worrying potentiality. And I was really pleased to think that they were picking up a ball of a contemporary issue and running with it. But in fact, none of them knew that there is already a religious exemption granted to a particular religion that says that they don't have to get vaccinated for anything. And the problem is, of course, once you've got one of those, it's the thin end of the wedge that means that others can start trying to press for the same kinds of treatment. Just in case you're interested, it's Christian science. And of course, um, in a nation of more than 25 million people, the fact that 974 people said they were Christian scientists in the 2016 census implies that it doesn't really apply to many people at all. And likely their numbers will have dwindled for the 2021 census. But still, it's something to think about, isn't it? That there's already one religion that has an exemption from vaccination. That's a very interesting, relevant um, thing to bring up. Thank you, Carol. Um, all right, David Smith, hello and welcome. Um, David is an associate professor in American politics and foreign policy at 
the United States Study Centre and the School of Social and Political Science at the University of Sydney. Um, his areas of interest include religion and politics, collective violence, theories of the state, Australia-US relations and US politics. And his research looks into political relations between states and minorities with a focus on religion in the United States. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourself and your research and perhaps give an overview on how you think religion is undervalued across the English speaking world? Yeah, thanks, my pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, so I uh, am trained in the study of American politics. For those of you who don't know, Australia's constitution, its sections about religion are largely plagiarized uh, from the American constitution. But nonetheless, the configuration of religion and politics in Australia looks really different from how it looks in the US. And there's an important lesson there, which is texts of any kind are not determinative. And this is something that people particularly don't understand when it comes to religion. There's this widespread idea that, well, you can figure out what a religion's about by just sort of naively reading its texts and uh, then you know what that's about. Now, that is uh, not true at all. And I, I, I realise that there is basically a very high level of religious illiteracy um, in this country. And you particularly see this in media treatment of religion. It's, often journalists have a pretty good idea of what the Catholic Church is about. And that's because so many journalists are former Catholics. But when it comes to just about any other religion, they're really all at sea. Um, now, that goes, first of all, for really obscure ones like uh, Christian science. Actually, a few years ago, because I've studied both uh, religion and vaccination politics, an ABC journalist asked me to explain the Christian science position uh, on vaccination, which I did. And then I got a very kind email from a Christian science lady who said, oh, thank you for representing us accurately. I don't see why they couldn't have talked to us. And it's like, well, yeah, the reason is they had no idea how to contact you. But um, so a really obscure one, 970 people. But also the media has no idea about, say, Pentecostalism. Uh, there are 600 million Pentecostals and charismatic Christians combined worldwide. Our Prime Minister is a Pentecostal. When Scott Morrison became Prime Minister, journalists freaked out about, oh, he's part of this religion that we know nothing about. And uh, the, the treatment of Morrison's Pentecostalism has just been depressingly bad. It's either really sort of underdetermined, like people have no idea of the role that Pentecostalism would play in Scott Morrison's life and politics, or it's completely overdetermined. So people attribute orthodox uh, sort of neoliberal economics policy to Morrison's Pentecostalism, which is really no different from what any of his uh, non Pentecostal colleagues uh, would be. So this level of religious illiteracy, which is illiteracy about a phenomenon that is still very, very important in the lives of many, many Australians, including many Australian elected officials, um, it is a real problem. I want to say something about specifically the discipline of studies of religion, because I'm not in the discipline of studies of religion. I'm a political scientist. Um, political science sort of discovered religion after the 9-11 attacks um, and has gradually engaged with it more and more. But for those of us outside of the, the discipline of studies of religion who study religion, it's very, very important for us to understand how studies of religion actually understands religion. Sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful, but it's a way of saying Studies of religion has taught us a lot about what religion actually is. Because as I understand it, this is one of the main questions of studies of religion. It's, it's you know, what is religion? And outside of that discipline in the social sciences, there's this really regrettable tendency to see religion purely in terms of belief. And to sort of map uh, very neatly, especially in politics, to say, well, this person is a member of this religion, therefore they believe X, therefore they will do Y. And all of those steps are wrong. Uh, you know, people experience religion in very different ways. They understand religion in very different ways. And certainly for members of elected office, they've got vastly different views about how religion should actually affect uh, the way they behave in office. So I'm very glad that studies of religion is surviving as a discipline at the University of Sydney. <laughs> Whether anyone survives as a department is a different story, but at least it's surviving as a discipline. Because um, 
for those of us outside of it, studies of religion is absolutely vital to us in improving our own understandings of how religion affects other things and how other things affect religion. And of course, another very important insight that studies of religion has given us is that you can't just neatly divide things into this is religion and, and this isn't religion. Uh, the way that the things, uh, the way that religious and non-religious things interact with each other is, uh, is extremely complicated. So it is very important for me that uh, studies of religion has survived as a discipline. And I really wish that there was more religious literacy in Australia, especially about religious formations other than Catholicism and Anglicanism, which you know a lot of journalists uh, do have experience with basically by virtue of, uh, of the school system. Because uh, it, in the future of religion, it's going to be other religious formations. Uh, those will continue to be important, but other religious formations are going to get increasingly important and we don't know enough about, journalists don't know enough about. Yeah, religious literacy, um, very good point. It's a very um, important thing that, yeah, we don't often uh, understand um, in the media very well. Um, turning to kind of like religion, specifically in like politics, um, Australia is often seen as a country that's quite good at separating religion and politics. Um, you know, obviously an impossible task um, as demonstrated by the fact that Dominic Perrottet has just become Premier of New South Wales today um, and the impacts obviously that that's gonna have. Um, this is a man who's open about like Catholicism informing his like anti-abortion, anti-queer views, and he's voted in parliament according to that rather than like according to his constituency necessarily. Um, and like according to the broad views of the Australian people. Um, do you guys think that it's fair to say that Australia is good at separating religion and politics um, compared to other countries or is Perite, just a more kind of open example of what is happening under the surface anyway. Um, maybe Carol, you first. I was going to hand the bat on to David, but I guess I could say something. Um, I'm not sure what it means to be good at separating religion and politics. Um, and I'm not sure that many countries do anymore because there are global trends and it might be that here in Australia, we're not especially aware of some of them. Um, the very large number of Pentecostal churches around the world that David just cited is an important issue. But it's also things like, um, for example, how many Christians or Muslims are there in the world? Uh, what's the fastest growing religion? What would you call people in the People's Republic of China, which is technically non-religious? What would you call the people there who actually are religious? Um, and those sorts of questions don't, I think the problem in Australia is that we have a really peculiar self image and it's almost entirely wrong. Um, uh, I used to teach a course in which I often drew a list of, you know, things Australians think they are relaxed, happy go lucky. Um, have a go, mate, you know, things Australians really are uptight, overworking, um, problems with gender relations, difficulties around all sorts of things that are just not acknowledged. And it seems to me, Marion Maddox, who's a good friend of mine, who was professor of um, politics at Macquarie, you, she's done a lot of writing uh, about religion in Australia and from a very different perspective from mine because she's remained within a faith tradition, albeit a very liberal one. But um, she has this idea that Australians think it codes well to be religious. Now, this is a problem that we in studies in religion go into because, of course, there's coded bad religion and good religion, nice religion and nasty religion. So you have to be a bit careful. But... Marion's opinion is that, you know, the Catholics and the Anglicans and the, um, you know, basically any sort of Christian, oh, and Buddhists, of course, they're nice, and so on and so forth. People think, oh, well, that is nice religion, with a capital N. It can't be a problem, really, if those people are in charge or if they're engaged with politics. They're nice. 
Um, Australia is, of course, hideously Islamophobic, but just about every Western nation is. Um, the big problem, of course, is that there's also a great deal of lack of understanding of, um, you know, different ethnic groups and the religions that they have. And so, of course, after September 11 in Australia, um, as well as mos mosques getting set on fire, Hindu temples, the Sikh Gurdwara, um, I think, uh, Maronite or, or a Syrian Orthodox church, they were all, you know, attacked. Oh, because, you know, the people, the white people were so ignorant about all of the particular religious varieties that they just thought, oh, they must be Muslims and Muslims must be terrorists. And it, it sounds like I, I sound like I'm being patronizing there. And I also sound like I'm saying something really, really simple. But I go to a depressing number of dinner parties with people who actually aren't uh, ignorant and are educated. And that's about the level of the discourse you get most of the time. So I'm not sure about the whole separation from religion and, and the state. I think that it's a really hard one and it plays out in many, many, many different ways. I do think, however, the religious literacy question in Australia results in perhaps what Marion Maddox suggests that we like a kind of vicarious religion. There's a woman in Britain called Grace Davy who works on this as well. The idea that other people will perform religious niceness for us. And then we don't have to go to church and we don't have to think about it, but you know, they'll be okay. David? Yeah, thanks very much uh, for that, uh, Carol. And just a, a full disclosure, um, I'm actually from the same faith tradition as Marion Maddox, which is the Uniting Church. My father's a minister in the Uniting Church, although I no longer um, identify with that uh, tradition. I haven't hostilely rejected it. I've just kind of uh, floated out of it, which is the <laughs> sort of a, a very common uh, way out of religion. Um, and furthermore, from the same part of uh, the Uniting Church as, as Marian Maddox. I've been looking recently at this sort of slightly paradoxical situation in Australia where we seem to have more and more conservative Christians getting elected than ever. Um, it is well documented at this point that there have been influxes of, well-organised influxes of Christian conservatives into state branches of the Liberal and National Parties. And yet, over the last five or 10 years, we have seen Christian conservatives lose on every big issue that matters to them. Um, losing on same-sex marriage, losing on abortion. Every Australian state is moving in a more liberal uh, direction on abortion. And Dominic Perrottet, yes, today, conservative Catholic, was forced to promise that New South Wales Parliament would still be allowed to have a conscience vote on assisted dying. OK, so what's going on here? Why is the Christian right so good at winning elections and so bad um, at winning on policy issues. And uh, this is something that I've addressed in uh, an article which I've just put in the chat. This is the conversation uh, vertical version of uh, the article that I wrote in uh, the journal Religion, State and Society. And one of the things that's going on here is there is not a strong connection with religion, at least it's traditionally understood, and nationalism in Australia. Um, that is, Australians don't, or at least don't any longer, consider Australia to be a Christian nation or a Christian country. Now, this is really important because where religion is most, where conservative religion is most effective politically, it's where it can really kind of piggyback on nationalism in the way that it does in the US, where conservative politicians can basically equate Christianity with the nation itself and can say that an attack on Christianity is an attack um, on the nation itself. There are lots of countries around the world where there is this strong association between Christianity or some other religion uh, and the nation. Poland is a very good uh, contemporary example. Ireland is an example of a country that used to have that really strong association, but which has more rapidly than anyone could have expected uh, is in the process of dissolving. In Australia, if it ever existed before, it is now um, very weak. And this is one of the reasons why... This is happening, I'm, which I'm using. This is uh, one of the reasons why it is so difficult for the Christian right to actually win um, on these policy battles. It's because they're in the minority on these big 
moral issues. And they actually find it very hard to enlist conservative allies who've got their eyes on the electorate. There simply aren't the kinds of votes for the Christian right in Australia as you have in the US. And because of the fact that Australia has compulsory voting, it's not like there are pockets of religious people out there waiting to be mobilised um, in the same way that you, uh, that you have in the US. Also, in Australia, the picture is very complicated in terms of political parties. If you look at the map of the same-sex marriage plebiscite, um, only five of the 17 electorates where there was a majority no vote were Liberal National electorates. 12 of them were Labor-held uh, electorates. Or, sorry, more accurately, 11 of them were Labor-held electorates. I think one of them was Catter's electorate uh, in, in Queensland. Um, and most of those, as we know, were in the western and southwestern uh, suburbs of Sydney. Um, and this reflects the complexity of the relationship between uh, religion and politics in Australia. Unlike in the US, it does not neatly break down on party lines. And, you know, when assisted dying comes up, you will find some of the strongest opponents of it in the Labor Party, um, where there is still a pretty strong uh, Catholic presence. There's still a strong conservative Catholic presence in, in parts of the union movement um, in Australia. Whereas on the liberal national side uh, of the equation, you will find um, people who are, they may be very conservative economically, but they're very liberal on issues like abortion and, uh, and sexuality. So one of the things that I want to emphasize is separation of church and state doesn't mean separation of religion and politics. And I would completely agree with Carol, but I don't think there's any country um, on earth that really rigidly separates religion and politics. Even countries that wage essentially crusades against religion, uh, you know, the, the, the possible presence of religion is still such a major force in politics uh, that politics is sort of organised around it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you can have formal separation of church and state. That doesn't mean separation of religion and politics. One of the major differences between Australia and the US, apart from Australia not being such a religious place, is the fact that on these major sort of moral issues, you just don't get neat breakdowns on party lines, which makes it very hard for conservatives to actually um, mobilise around these issues. Having said that, major churches in Australia are very good politically at defending their privileges. And one of the reasons why they're so good at it is because, exactly as Carol said, these are things that most people don't know about and don't care about. Uh, the um, things like the, the chaplaincy program. So one of the things that we're really seeing in Australia at the moment is the discursive shift to basically talking about religion in terms of minority rights. So when we talk about the possibility of religious freedom legislation, um, yes, this may allow religions to sort of effectively defend their privileges, possibly even carve out new ones, but it's also important to see that's a discursive shift that is actually a retreat of religion in Australian life, a retreat to a minority position. As Marian has pointed out, um, prior to about 2010, major religious groups in Australia were always against religious freedom legislation. There were multiple attempts to have stronger enshrinement of religious freedom in the Australian constitution or to have legislation at both the federal and the state level which would protect religious freedom. The Anglican and Catholic churches not the Uniting Church, but the Anglican and Catholic churches were consistently opposed to this because they thought that it would open the door to much stricter separation of church and state in Australia. And they saw it as pandering to minority religious groups, especially Muslims and, and uh, secularists. The fact that they are now embracing this language, um, Freedom for Faith, which is a conservative think tank um, that is advocating for this religious freedom legislation, its major policy document about this is called Protecting Diversity. When Dominic Perrottet was asked today at a press conference about his own religious faith, he said more diversity rather than less diversity is a good thing. So the acceptance of diversity as a framework, which is always linked with minority rights, this marks a very important discursive shift uh, in religion and politics in Australia. So many good points there, thank you. Um, did you want to respond, Carol? Or? I was just thinking about so many things that get brought up when you think about those sorts of things. It's not just, for example, the chaplaincy program. 
a lot of people are genuinely shocked when they understand that conservative Christian schools can sack gay staff. A lot of people are incredibly shocked to learn that there are hospitals in which you can't have a pregnancy terminated. Um, they don't really understand that when you've handed over various of the service arms of um, government or of what would be a fully secular government, like education and health and job provision programs and all sorts of things, and then you've stacked the case so that the religions are all given exemptions and privileges for various sorts of things that other companies don't get. Um, I've often said to students that people should stop thinking that being nostalgic for religion or having somebody else perform religion for you is a good idea. They should try to look with a much greater um, clarity at what the performance of religion is actually telling us. And the performance of religion in that protective way that David was just speaking about is largely about punishing other groups or gaining advantage over them. And usually it's a majority group. And of course, the question about religious um, protection legislation becomes really interesting only really with the 2016 census, because it's at that point where non-religion becomes the largest um, identifier that Australians choose. There are 30% of people who say they're non-religious. The interesting thing, of course, is again, a lot of people who, are, who don't know much about census data don't realize that actually that's not all of them because that doesn't count. The ones who call themselves Marxists, humanists, atheists, agnostics, uh, rationalists, skeptics. If you add all of them in as well, um, it's more than 30%. And that means now that Christianity is only a majority if all the denominations get together. And in fact, a lot of the denominations don't really like each other and don't actually think that they're actually real Christians. Uh, the Protestant divide, which puts Protestants on one side and Catholics and Orthodox and all of the other, particularly the Eastern churches that um, most Protestants know almost nothing about, um, that is a big division running down the middle of Australian Christianity in politics, at least. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but I, I do tell my students always, you know, these are the people who will sack the lesbian teacher if it's a church school and who will refuse to make the same sex wedding cake, the example that was always used in the UK legislation. So it's worth, you know, they're worth thinking about. Considering that so much of our population now is non-religious, um, why do you think that a, a secular studies of religion, like secular way of looking at religion, is still so undervalued in Australia and across the English-speaking world? Well, there's a short answer to that and there's a long answer, and I'll give you the short one. <laughs> um, Universities are organized in all sorts of ways, but one of the things that matters is the antiquity of the discipline. Studies in religion was actually instantiated at the University of Sydney in 1976. It is thus 45 years old. Departments that were begun around about that time very rarely grew to be large. There are one or two exceptions, gender and cultural studies, you might say, but smaller departments that were founded around the same time you know, or, or shortly after, remain stuck at somewhere between like three and five staff members. You can't really do very much with that sort of person power. Our zenith, our high point, was the year 2001, in which we constituted six people, which equaled five full-time jobs. We presently constitute four people, equaling three and a half full-time jobs. This is partly about numbers games and organization of curricula and school structures and all sorts of things which are probably not really very interesting. But the other thing that we suffer from is that the feeder unit from schools, studies of religion, which is quite healthy actually, is unfortunately taught only in church schools. And almost 
all the students who do studies of religion at school, it doesn't mean that they're um, necessarily, um, you know, problematic in any way, but they look at subjects and it's not one of those places where you carry on a lot. And church schools tend to teach the monotheisms because they understand them. And we don't have a teacher training program that specializes in studies of religion. Um, we actually have for decades attempted to negotiate such a thing with, with uh, education, which used to be a faculty and is now only a school. And it doesn't work that way. Education students used to be able, when I say used to, 15 years ago, it's a long time, be able to take lots of general units. And then gradually the educationists realized that to hang on to the FSL, the funding that comes with each undergraduate student, they had to fill their degree up with education subjects. So then their students wouldn't take any of their load anywhere else. Um, and we therefore stopped having these students. And I can pinpoint when it all happened really, it was probably about 2005. Our greatest ever year as the first year intake was 2002. And it was obviously the September 11 led recovery. We had 300 students in first year. For a long time, it hung around 150. We're lucky now if it's 60 to 80. And part of that is simply strategizing within faculties to cut people's opportunities, students' opportunities to cross into other disciplines. And of course, it's the powerful that decide to do that. Um, but I do think it matters too, that mostly the religious studies course at high school level is not offered to students in state schools, which I think would be very helpful. David, do you have anything to add about um, the kind of like different value placed on secular studies and religion or you know, an, an understanding of religion in general across the English speaking world as opposed to um, the rest of the world? Um. I think that there's a tendency for people to, in a secular society, to think, well, religion is something for religious people and there's not really uh, any need to know or understand um, something about it. Now, occasionally you get an event happening which prompts uh, some sort of wave of, of interest um, in finding out about usually a particular religion like Islam after 9-11 or Pentecostalism after Scott Morrison got elected, but usually in this uh, very superficial way, because actually understanding what a religion is about, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort um, because it can't just be gleaned by reading sacred texts because religion as studies of religion has taught us is all about experience um, and experience by virtue, you know, by definition, you can't have somebody else's experience and finding out about the nature of uh, religious experience. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. And that's just not uh, something that most people are prepared to do in a secular society. I would also say from the point of view of social science, um, for a long time, and I'm talking about, you know, for at least a century, there was a belief that religion was just going to go away that the sort of natural progress of human societies was as society becomes more scientific, uh, more rational, as scientific rationality invades every part of uh, human life, religion is just going to go away. Religious practice is, uh, is going to drop, um, especially the way that Western European countries secularised, became seen as kind of the model of uh, what would happen with the rest of the world um, as the rest of the world got got richer and more scientific. Now, um, that, even though there have been distinctive secularizing trends, um, that, isn't, that, that story is not what has happened. Uh, religion has taken on a lot of different new forms, uh, different types of religion. You know, yeah, some forms of religion have almost dropped out of the picture entirely. Different forms of uh, religion have arisen. People experience religion in very different ways. So the whole sort of uh, traditional model of religion as the social sciences understood it is something that came along really before the advent of, uh, of mass media, which has completely changed um, the way that people experience religion. Among other things, it's really opened up the field for configurations like Pentecostalism and charismatic Christianity, where you don't need the traditional 
congregation in a room listening to the traditional authority figure. This is a religion that is driven by, uh, by media entrepreneurs um, and which has been successfully copied by a lot of other religious configurations as well. So yeah, there's, um, I think that the secularism is a victim of its own success um, in terms of not understanding the need to understand, uh, the, the continuing need to understand religion in a secular society. Thank you for that. Um, did you have anything to add, Carol? Or? I was going to say something about also, uh, I, a lot of people find it difficult, but I think it's actually helpful. A lot of really good study in religious configurations now looks at it from the point of view of secular institutional studies and also from the point of view of marketization and consumption. And I think that that's really important. Um, Pentecostalism is a great religion to use as an example of what a religious form in the contemporary first world, a consumerist, capitalist, mediatized first world should look like. Because the old kind of religion was a parish. And if you lived on this street, the nearest church to you that was your denomination was your parish church and it didn't matter if the minister was uninteresting to you or if the company didn't suit you what happens now is people look at the products and they go to the church that meets their needs and when their needs are no longer met they change and it's very important to understand that a, a, a church like Hillsong which has a very, very large membership. Nevertheless, their turnover is really quick. Like the majority of people stay at Hillsong between 18 months and three years. It's, it's not something that you bed down in for life. And one of these reasons is it's kind of youth oriented. It's high demand. You have all sorts of arrangements, Bible study on one night, um, movie on another night, um, volleyball on another night and when people get older or they get jobs that become demanding or they have children or they do other things what generally happens to people coming out of high demand pentecostal churches is they either go back to a more mainstream version of christianity which is less demanding or they become non-religious entirely so there's a real interesting in, in how that works as well but basically nowadays the spiritual supermarket is the model that most people work off. A lot of people don't like it if you say it as frankly as that, because they think it kind of vulgarizes religion. You know, is it really not much different to breakfast cereal? Well, there actually is a sense in which it isn't, because the kind of primary process for a lot of people nowadays is becoming a better self self-actualization, self-improvement, how you feel like you're going to transform yourself, you're going to diet, you're going to change your, your job, you're going to change your clothes, you're going to change your spouse, you're going to change your house. And so the idea of, I think it was the American sociologist Wade Clark Roof who introduced the idea that some people are dwellers and some people are seekers. And the seeker idea had been around before some British sociologists had played with it as well. But dwellers are people who are born into a religion and they're happy with it and they stay there. You know, they might move around a little bit. They might be less involved when their kids are young and more involved when they get towards death or the other way around. They might be more involved when their kids are young because they want to get involved in the church school or something like that. But they're dwellers, they stay. The seekers are, does it meet my needs? Oh, it meets my needs. It's fantastic. I'm really interested. I'm stimulated. I'm excited. I'm spiritually growing. Three years later, I'm not. I've flatlined. Where do I go next? Um, I'll, I'll just add to that on a personal note. Um, one of the reasons why I think I'm a decent lecturer is because I saw so many of my dad's sermons at a young age and my dad taught me uh, as, as soon as I was capable of learning the lesson. He said, people in this country don't listen to you because they think they should listen to you. Even if you're a church minister, you have to actually make it interesting for them. Like my dad experienced the reality of that, uh, of that religious market. Um, you know, he, was, uh, he started out as a minister in Julia Creek, which is a tiny town in the middle of Queensland. 
nonetheless, it was a place where people actually had religious options. Um, he had originally come from England, where there was still a sense that you listen to the vicar out of a sense of you should. Uh, in the middle of Queensland, he discovered if he wasn't um, saying things that interested them, they would go somewhere else. And I'm sure at that time that there already would have been Pentecostals uh, setting up shop. Um, so central Queensland is a little bit like upstate New York uh, was in the 1830s, burned over country, uh, land of religious revivals. So he had a lot of competitors. Um, and yeah, without actually trivialising um, religion, you know, I did learn these lessons from him about it is incredibly important to communicate <laughs> in ways that people find interesting uh, or they will uh, go elsewhere. I remember him telling me, never have a wedding sermon that's longer than seven minutes, um, you know, because uh, people's attention will, uh, will wander. Um, and yeah, I, I have I tried to, stuck to, the, to, to stick to those uh, rules ever since. Good lessons learned. <laughs> um, we don't have a huge amount of time left, so I just wanted to um, get into a bit of what has happened at UCID this year, um, especially because I think there's, um, there was a massive effort from staff and students to save the department, obviously, um, or the discipline. Um, and I think there's probably a lot that, you know, we can learn from that that can be applied to other campaigns when, you know, cuts to the arts inevitably come up again. Um, would you be able to kind of run us through, Carol, like the negotiations that went on, um, the things that you think actually um, really made a difference in terms of saving studies and religion when it was on the chopping block? Well, I'm probably going to say something that nobody really wants to hear, but basically it's not off, off the chopping block. And um, what's been happening is an ongoing process and people shouldn't be surprised. I mean, we have basically, University of Sydney, the last large faculty of arts left in the country. Most of them have been emptied. We have more than 50 majors. There must be cuts, it is inevitable. I mean, I'm not saying that I think that there should be, and I know that were there political will to spend money in different ways, there would be no need to. But the point is that our Faculty of Arts is like 10 times the size of the majority of them in the country. And a lot of people wonder if we're actually worth um, all that money. Uh, also, it was the fifth or I think the sixth attempt to close religion since I came here, came to the University of Sydney in 1981. So uh, I was a little jaded all round and I thought it was wonderful that students and staff organised things. In fact, I personally wrote to 600 academics around the, the world asking them to sign the open letter and doing things like that because I have pretty extensive connections and I'm op I'm basically open and sociable and that means that you know you kind of think well I guess I should be the one to do it but the truth of the matter is that the proposed cuts were much wider than the two named departments for um, theatre and performance studies as was pointed out the last standing named theatre studies department in universe in the Australian uh, university sector and of course for studies and religion We've only, I think there are only three departments in the country and we are the oldest. Um, actually, there'd already been a round of redundancies. A lot of people were gone. Some pretty senior staff went from FAS in the redundancies that happened, voluntary redundancies at the beginning of this year. And other departments were already told that they also were in the red, that they weren't generating profit and that staff would go. Now, the difference with TAPS and religious studies was that the departments were rather foolishly, I think, actually named as being for the CHOP. Um, on the 16th of September, we learned that this wasn't going to be the case and the change management proposal that um, the faculty is now considering was released. I'm not going to try to discuss it with you because it won't make any sense uh, unless you've actually read it, but it is incoherent. Uh, obviously composed by an idiot who doesn't actually know anything about the faculty. It knows nothing about what studies and religion does and um, has proposed the most ridiculous, laughable potential future, which we all know won't work. So either that has been proposed cynically because they know it's not going to work. And so at the end of next year, we'll all be up the chop again. Uh, everybody get ready 
for rolling protest. This is not going away. But I do think that Alana Bowden organising the open letter, managing all of the signatures that came in constantly every day, updating. I think that um, the students who helped out um, the SRC's education collective generally, um, but Kelton Muir de Moore, who was already a battle-hardened veteran of the attempts to shut the Sydney College of the Arts, um, these things were really, really important. People, people for things to, to revolve around, to coalesce and, and focus on. And I think that it must be said that the noise around religion and taps was embarrassing to parts of the university, shall I say euphemistically. David, your take on this. Um, I don't really have very much to add to that. Um, and I want to emphasise Carol's point that, yeah, this is a lot bigger um, uh, than even the closures of those two departments. Uh, this, yeah, this, as, as Carol said, this is about the arts faculty um, as an entity. Um, in the future, there, I don't know if there are going to be departments at all, um, so there's a lot of people very enamoured of having control at the school level. Um, often the schools are conglomerations of actually quite disparate uh, departments and uh, disparate disciplines. There's, you know, proposals to reshuffle um, some of those in ways that don't make a huge amount of sense to the people uh, involved. Um, and yeah, but I think that the, the end game of that is that there won't actually be departments. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've been told that departments are this kind of weird, archaic privilege that only exists at the University of Sydney Arts Faculty, doesn't exist anywhere else. Whereas if you go to any university in the United States uh, or the UK, you'll actually find that they're organised around discipline. So we pretend to be really aspirational to those kinds of um, places when it suits us. Uh, but in terms of organisation, we seem to be determined to go down to uh, a very different path. I want to add one thing. I never realised, but, you know, digital publication is an extraordinary thing. Friends that hadn't been at the university for like 30 years read every one of the Onisoir articles. They turned up online. Ranika, you wrote, Ranika, you wrote the first one. You handed down the first article in defence of studying religion. And other really good student writers, um, past and present students, weighed into the debate and on the side of taps as well. And Oni is really, I'm surprised, loads of people read it. I mean, I knew I always did, but... It's, it's a wonderful thing, digital publishing. It's a lot better than it used to be. I mean, I was a student at Sydney Uni 20 years ago. It's a lot better than it was uh, 20 years ago. And um, having an online presence, which it obviously <laughs> didn't have then, um, uh, yeah, is very... Yeah, like Onisoir breaks stories and stuff uh, now, which, well, it didn't exactly do that when, uh, when I was a student. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we get people reading random on a articles from all over the world and like emailing the editors, um, you know, not always like good stuff either. I know there's been some attacks from like, you know, just like different countries, you know, because we published, um, you know, articles that, yeah, from Chile, the editors this year got, um, got a bit of heat from the country of Chile for an article they posted. So yeah, on does go it goes very far around the world. Um, does anyone in the audience have um, any questions that they want to ask David or Carol? Uh, yep, yeah. sorry. <clears throat> I haven't been able to change my name. I'm Sarah. I was just, um, this talk's really fascinating and I'd love to know if you two had any recommendations for further reading in like religion and politics in Australia. David? Um, uh, Marion Maddox's book, God Under, Under Howard, Howard, 
Yeah, uh, it was is I believe one of the really uh, kind of key books about um, religion and and politics. There has unfortunately there is quite a lot of stuff about um, religion and Australian politics, but it's usually in journal article form. Um, there aren't as many uh, great books out there um, as there should be, but that's a that's a really good um, starting point. Um, I'll plug my I'll plug my own article if you go to that conversation link. Not necessarily because of the article itself, but I've linked to a lot of stuff there uh, about religion and politics in Australia, which hopefully you'll find useful. Thanks so much, Nina. Um, just to go back to something you said before, David, I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about whether you think that there are differences in different politicians from the Christian right in Australia and how they govern. Should we expect Morrison, a Pentecostalist, to be different to Peritae, a, a conservative Catholic? Yeah, absolutely. There are very, there are major differences between uh, politicians of the, the Christian right in Australia, and there always have been. And I think that it is really all about um, their priorities, right? So some Christian right politicians really do want to push a conservative social agenda, regardless of how unpopular it might be. They see it as that's their responsibility. That's what they uh, were put in power to do. Uh, Morrison is not in that mould. Um, you know, Morrison didn't join in the protests outside New South Wales Parliament House around abortion. Tony Abbott did, Barnaby Joyce did. Um, Morrison very pointedly stayed out of uh, stayed out of that one. We've had um, Christian right politicians who've got to Australian Parliament and then turned out to be complete surprise packages. Uh, the guy whose name I can't remember, Stephen something from uh, Families First. Um, he turned out to be all that he really wanted to talk about was better treatment of uh, refugees in Australia. He didn't prioritise. Um, Christian right issues at all. Um, you've got these genuinely interesting relics like Fred Nile, who's been around for so long that he's got uh, opinions on everything. And as Fred Nile has not, I'm not speaking in favour, but he's an extremely effective legislator. Like he's been around for so long. He's this major legislative deal maker. He knows how to sort of balance his issues with other issues in order to get things that he wants done. Um, a lot of other Christian right politicians are just bulls in China shops uh, coming in and, uh, you know, and Abbott was like this uh, sort of trying to make a splash and uh, getting absolutely nowhere. So, yeah, it's not just about the personal beliefs of these politicians or their denominational affiliations. It's about their priorities. And um, that's often very hard to predict uh, what their priorities are going to be. And I think for me, at the moment, Perite is still an unknown quantity. Um, you know, he said today that he wanted to be a family's premier. That could definitely be uh, sort of coded language for I want a conservative um, social agenda. But he may find that he's up against the same kinds of constraints as someone like Morrison uh, is. So we really don't know at this point how far Perite is going to try to, uh, to push it. I was just going to add to that, that, that idea about someone being around for a long time and becoming a very skilled operator. A politician who was an extremely conservative Catholic, Brian Harradine, was immensely powerful for years. Yes. But the fascinating thing about him was he was definitely extremely conservative on anything to do with sex and didn't want foreign aid to countries where it was being spent on birth control and all sorts of things like that. But he was actually a leftist on the labour market and voted for workers' rights. Yeah. Um, and he had a kind of patchy middle-middle um, record on environmentalism. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that's very interesting when you look at Christian right politicians is that some of them have very different stances on the environment. Yep, and absolutely. that's a, an important distinction. Yes. Thanks for that, Nina. That's a great question. Um, someone's put in the chat, what are some good resources that you might recommend that investigate relationships between religion um, and Australian, like education policies? Um, Marion Maddox, again, isn't the book called Taking God to School? Yes. Um, it's amazing. And again, very readable and loads of fun and good analysis and much more recent than God under Howard. 
Fantastic. Um, is we're kind of running out of time. So is there anything that um, David or Carol you'd like to finish on as a lasting note? Oh, I've got an anecdote about journalists in Australia not knowing anything about religion, which is where David began. Um, many, many years ago, a nice man from the Herald called me and said, could he have a coffee with me? He wanted to talk about um, reporting on religion. His name was Peter Frey, and at that point, he was a sports journalist. I'm so delighted that I know him, however tangentially now, because he runs Crikey now, and it's one of the most important um, you know, news outlets that we could get. But we had a wonderful conversation in which we laughed our head off at some of the mistakes in the paper. Uh, for example, at one point, just after 9-11, um, ASIO said they wanted to empl employ people who knew about the four pil pillars of Islam. Uh, on another occasion, I saw a journalist say, it is harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I was thinking, my goodness, the level of this kind of ignorance is utterly unbelievable. I also just wanted to say that where some of our really best students have ended up uh, in the last couple of years in the labour market might surprise you. It's been security studies um, and places like DFAT, um, Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade in Canberra. And that's where our good honours and PhD students, a lot of them have found work because there is an interest in securitisation areas about actually knowing something. There wasn't 20 years ago, but it, it's, it's clicked. Um, I'll say for, after trashing journalists, um, I find Andrew West on the Religion and Ethics Report on Radio National is quite good. Um, he doesn't know everything, but he knows what he doesn't know, and he's very good at finding people uh, who do know. So I would, um, uh, I would, I'd recommend him. And if we're going for the ABC, James Carlton is very light-hearted, but God forbid is a fun enough program, and there is some factual stuff in it. Um, Noel Debian is a really good, and Compass on telly make good documentaries. Generally, a little bit on the side of nice religion not mm. nasty religion, but nevertheless, um, mostly accurate, mostly worth paying some attention to. Mm. I agree. Well, thank you so much um, to both of you. This has been a really fantastic discussion and um, I will definitely be putting the recording up on the Radical Education page as well so that you can share it around with you know, friends and anyone who might be interested.